Chapter thirty seven of Wives and Daughters. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell. Chapter thirty seven A Fluke and What Came of It. The honour and glory of having a lover of her own was soon to fall to Molly's share, though to be sure it was a little deduction from the honour that the man who came with the full intention of proposing to her ended by making Cynthia an offer. It was Mr. Cox, who came back to Hollingford to follow out the purpose he had announced to Mr. Gibson nearly two years before, of inducing Molly to become his wife as soon as he should have succeeded to his uncle's estate. He was now a rich, though still a red-haired, young man. He came to the George Inn, bringing his horses and his groom, not that he was going to ride much, but that he thought such outward signs of his riches might help on his suit, and he was so justly modest in his estimation of himself that he believed that he needed all extraneous aid. He piqued himself on his constancy, and indeed considering that he had been so much restrained by his duty, his affection, and his expectations to his crabbed old uncle, that he had not been able to go much into society, and very rarely indeed into the company of young ladies, such fidelity to Molly was very meritorious, at least in his own eyes. Mr. Gibson, too, was touched by it, and made it a point of honour to give him a fair field, all the time sincerely hoping that Molly would not be such a goose as to lend a willing ear to a youth who could never remember the difference between apophysis and epiphysis. He thought it as well not to tell his wife more of Mr. Cox's antecedents than that he had been a former pupil, who had relinquished, all that he knew of, understood, the medical profession because an old uncle had left him enough money to be idle. Mrs. Gibson, who felt that she had somehow lost her place in her husband's favour, took it into her head that she could reinstate herself if she was successful in finding a good match for his daughter Molly. She knew that her husband had forbidden her to try for this end, as distinctly as words could express a meaning, but her own words so seldom expressed her meaning, or if they did, she held to her opinion so loosely, that she had no idea but that it was the same with other people. Accordingly she gave Mr. Cox a very sweet and gracious welcome. "'It is such a pleasure to me to make acquaintance with the former pupils of my husband. He has spoken to me so often of you that I quite feel as if you were one of the family, as indeed I am sure that Mr. Gibson considers you.' Mr. Cox felt much flattered, and took the words as a happy omen for his love affair. "'Is Miss Gibson in?' asked he, blushing violently. "'I knew her formerly. That is to say, I lived in the same house with her for more than two years, and it would be a great pleasure to—to—' "'Certainly, I am sure she will be glad to see you. I sent her and Cynthia—you don't know my daughter Cynthia, I think, Mr. Cox. She and Molly are such great friends. Out for a brisk walk this frosty day, but I think they will soon come back.' She went on saying agreeable nothings to the young man, who received her attentions with a certain complacency, but was all the time much more engaged in listening to the well-remembered click at the front door, the shutting it to again with household care, and the sound of the familiar bounding footstep on the stair. At last they came. Cynthia entered first, bright and blooming, fresh colour in her cheeks and lips, fresh brilliance in her eyes. She looked startled at the sight of a stranger, and for an instant she stopped short at the door as if taken by surprise. Then in came Molly softly behind her, smiling, happy, dimpled, but not such a glowing beauty as Cynthia. "'Oh, Mr. Cox, is it you?' said she, going up to him with an outstretched hand, and greeting him with simple friendliness. "'Yes, it seems such a long time since I saw you. You were grown so much—so much—well, I suppose I mustn't say what.' he replied, speaking hurriedly, and holding her hand all the time, rather to her discomfiture. Then Mrs. Gibson introduced her daughter, and the two girls spoke of the enjoyment of their walk. Mr. Cox marred his cause in that very first interview, if indeed he could ever have had any chance, by his precipitancy in showing his feelings, and Mrs. Gibson helped him to march by trying to assist him. Molly lost her open friendliness of manner, and began to shrink away from him in a way which he thought was a very ungrateful return for all his faithfulness to her these two years past, and after all she was not the wonderful beauty his fancy or his love had painted her. The Miss Kirkpatrick was far more beautiful and much easier of access. For Cynthia put on all her pretty airs, her look of intent interest in what any one was saying to her, let the subject be what it would, 
as if it was the thing she cared most about in the whole world. Her unspoken deference, in short, all the unconscious ways she possessed by instinct of tickling the vanity of men. So, while Molly quietly repelled him, Cynthia drew him to her by her soft, attractive ways, and his constancy fell before her charms. He was thankful that he had not gone too far with Molly, and grateful to Mr. Gibson for having prohibited all declarations two years ago, for Cynthia, and Cynthia alone, could make him happy. After a fortnight's time, during which he had entirely veered round in his allegiance, he thought it desirable to speak to Mr. Gibson. He did so with a certain sense of exultation in his own correct behaviour in the affair, but at the same time feeling rather ashamed of the confession of his own changeableness, which was naturally involved. Now, it had so happened that Mr. Gibson had been unusually little at home during the fortnight that Mr. Cox had ostensibly lodged at the George, but in reality had spent the greater part of his time at Mr. Gibson's house, so that he had seen very little of his former pupil, and on the whole had thought him improved, especially after Molly's manner had made her father pretty sure that Mr. Cox stood no chance in that quarter. But Mr. Gibson was quite ignorant of the attraction which Cynthia had had for the young man. If he had perceived it, he would have nipped it in the bud pretty quickly, for he had no notion of any girl, even though only partially engaged to one man, receiving offers from others, if a little plain speaking could prevent it. Mr. Cox had asked for a private interview. They were sitting in the old surgery, now called the consulting-room, but still retaining so much of its former self as to be the last place in which Mr. Cox could feel himself at ease. He was red up to the very roots of his red hair, and kept turning his glossy new hat round and round in his fingers, unable to find out the proper way of beginning his sentence, so at length he plunged in, grammar or no grammar. "'Mr. Gibson, I dare say you'll be surprised. I'm sure I am at—at what I want to say. But I think it's the part of an honourable man, as you said yourself, sir, a year or two ago, to—to speak to the father first, and as you, sir, stand in the place of a father to Miss Kirkpatrick, I should like to express my feelings, my hopes, or perhaps I should say wishes, in short." "'Miss Kirkpatrick,' said Mr. Gibson, a good deal surprised. "'Yes, sir,' continued on Mr. Cox, rushing on he had got so far. I know it may appear inconsistent and changeable, but I do assure you I came here with a heart as faithful to your daughter as ever beat in a man's bosom. I most fully intended to offer myself and all that I had to her acceptance before I left. But really, sir, if you had seen her manner to me every time I endeavoured to press my suit a little, it was more than coy, it was absolutely repellent, there could be no mistaking it. While Miss Kirkpatrick— He looked modestly down, and smoothed the nap of his hat, smiling a little while he did so. "'While Miss Kirkpatrick,' repeated Mr. Gibson in such a stern voice, that Mr. Cox, landed esquire as he now was, felt as much discomfited as he used to do when he was an apprentice, and Mr. Gibson had spoken to him in a similar manner. "'I was only going to say, sir, that so far as one can judge from manner and willingness to listen, and apparent pleasure in my visits, altogether I think I may venture to hope that Miss Kirkpatrick is not quite indifferent to me, and I would wait, you have no objection, have you, sir, to my speaking to her, I mean?" said Mr. Cox, a little anxious at the expression on Mr. Gibson's face. "'I do assure you I haven't a chance with Miss Gibson,' he continued, not knowing what to say, and fancying that his inconstancy was rankling in Mr. Gibson's mind. "'No, I don't suppose you have. Don't go and fancy it is that which is annoying me. You're mistaken about Miss Kirkpatrick, however. I don't believe she could ever have meant to give you encouragement.' Mr. Cox's face grew perceptibly paler. His feelings, if evanescent, were evidently strong. "'I think, sir, if you could have seen her—I don't consider myself vain, and manner is so difficult to describe—at any rate you could have no objections to my taking my chance of speaking to her.' "'Of course, if you won't be convinced other ways, I can have no objection. But if you'll take my advice, you will spare yourself the pain of a refusal. I may, perhaps, be trenching on confidence. But I think I ought to tell you that her affections are otherwise engaged." "'It cannot be,' said Mr. Cox. "'Mr. Gibson, there must be some mistake. I think I have gone as far as I dared in expressing my feelings, and her manner has been most gracious. I don't think she could have misunderstood my meaning. Perhaps she has changed her mind. It is possible that, after consideration, she has learnt to prefer another, is it not?' "'By another you mean yourself, I suppose. I can believe in such inconstancy.' 
he could not help in his own mind giving a slight sneer at the instance before him. But I should be very sorry to think that Miss Kirkpatrick could be guilty of it. But she may. It is a chance. Will you allow me to see her? Certainly, my poor fellow. For intermingled with a little contempt was a good deal of respect for the simplicity, the unworldliness, the strength of feeling, even though the feeling was evanescent. I will send her to you directly. Thank you, sir. God bless you for a kind friend. Mr. Gibson went upstairs to the drawing-room, where he was pretty sure he could find Cynthia. There she was, as bright and careless as usual, making up a bonnet for her mother, and chattering to Molly as she worked. "'Cynthia, you will oblige me by going down into my consulting-room at once. Mr. Cox wants to speak to you.' "'Mr. Cox,' said Cynthia, "'what can he want with me?' Evidently she answered her own question as soon as it was asked, for she coloured, and avoided meeting Mr. Gibson's severe, uncompromising look. As soon as she had left the room, Mr. Gibson sat down, and took up a new Edinburgh lying on the table, as an excuse for conversation. Was there anything in the article that made him say, after a minute or two, to Molly, who sat silent and wondering, "'Molly, you must ever trifle with the love of an honest man. You don't know what pain you may give.' Presently Cynthia came back into the drawing-room, looking very much confused. Most likely she would not have returned if she had known that Mr. Gibson was still there, but it was such an unheard-of thing for him to be sitting in that room in the middle of the day, reading or making pretense to read, that she had never thought of his remaining. He looked up at her the moment she came in, so there was nothing for it but putting a bold face on it, and going back to her work. "'Is Mr. Cox still downstairs? asked Mr. Gibson. "'No, he is gone. He asked me to give you both his kind regards. I believe he is leaving this afternoon.' Cynthia tried to make her manner as commonplace as possible, but she did not look up, and her voice trembled a little. Mr. Gibson went on looking at his book for several minutes but Cynthia felt that more was coming, and only wished it would come quickly, for the severe silence was very hard to bear. It came at last. "'I trust this will never occur again, Cynthia,' said he in grave displeasure. "'I should not feel satisfied with the conduct of any girl, however free, who could receive marked attentions from a young man with complacency, and so lead him on to make an offer which she never meant to accept. But what must I think of a young woman in your position, engaged?' yet excepting most graciously, for that was the way Cox expressed it, the overtures of another man. Do you consider what unnecessary pain you have given him by your thoughtless behaviour? I call it thoughtless, but it's the mildest epithet I can apply to it. I beg that such a thing may not occur again, or I shall be obliged to characterise it more severely." Molly could not imagine what more severely could be, for her father's manner appeared to her almost cruel in its sternness. Cynthia coloured up extremely, then went pale, and at length raised her beautiful appealing eyes full of tears to Mr. Gibson. He was touched by that look, but he resolved immediately not to be mollified by any of her physical charms of expression, but to keep to his sober judgment of her conduct. "'Please, Mr. Gibson, hear my side of the story before you speak so hardly to me. I did not mean to—to to flirt. I merely meant to make myself agreeable. I can't help doing that.' and that goose of a Mr. Cox seems to have fancied I meant to give him encouragement." "'Do you mean that you were not aware that he was falling in love with you?' Mr. Gibson was melting into a readiness to be convinced by that sweet voice and pleading face. "'Well, I suppose I must speak truly.' Cynthia blushed and smiled, ever so little, but it was a smile, and it hardened Mr. Gibson's heart again. "'I did think once or twice that he was becoming a little more complimentary than the occasion required but I hate throwing cold water on people, and I never thought he could take it into his silly head to fancy himself seriously in love, and to make such a fuss at the last, after only a fortnight's acquaintance." "'You seem to have been pretty well aware of his silliness. I should rather call it simplicity. Don't you think you should have remembered that it might lead him to exaggerate what you were doing, and saying, into encouragement?" "'Perhaps. I dare say I'm all wrong, and that he is all right,' said Cynthia peaked and pouting. We used to say in France that les absents ont toujours tort, but really it seems as if here—' She stopped. She was unwilling to be impertinent to a man whom she respected and liked. She took up another point of her defence, and rather made matters worse. Besides, Roger would not allow me to consider myself as finally engaged to him, 
I would willingly have done it, but he would not let me." "'Nonsense! Don't let us go on talking about it, Cynthia. I have said all that I mean to say. I believe that you are only thoughtless, as I told you before. But don't let it happen again." He left the room at once, to put a stop to the conversation, the continuance of which would serve no useful purpose, and perhaps end by irritating him. "'Not guilty, but we recommend the prisoner not to do it again. It's pretty much that, isn't it, Molly?' said Cynthia, letting her tears down fall even while she smiled. "'I do believe your father might make a good woman of me yet, if he would only take the pains and wasn't quite so severe. And to think of that stupid little fellow making all this mischief! He pretended to take it to heart, as if he had loved me for years, instead of only for days. I dare say only for hours, if the truth were told." "'I was afraid he was becoming very fond of you,' said Molly. At least it struck me once or twice, but I knew he could not stay long, and I thought it would only make you uncomfortable if I said anything about it. But now I wish I had." "'It wouldn't have made a bit of difference,' replied Cynthia. "'I knew he liked me, and I like to be liked. It's born in me to try to make every one I come near fond of me, but then they shouldn't carry it too far, for it becomes very troublesome if they do. I shall hate red-haired people for the rest of my life. To think of such a man as that being the cause of your father's displeasure with me." Molly had a question at her tongue's end that she longed to put. She knew it was indiscreet, but at last it came out almost against her will. "'Shall you tell Roger about it?' Cynthia replied. "'I have not thought about it. No, I don't think I shall. There's no need. Perhaps if we are ever married." "'Ever married?' said Molly, under her breath. But Cynthia took no notice of the exclamation, until she had finished the sentence which it interrupted. "'And I can see his face and know his mood. I may tell it him then, but not in writing, and when he is absent it might annoy him.' "'I am afraid it would make him uncomfortable,' said Molly, simply. "'And yet it must be so pleasant to be able to tell him everything all your difficulties and troubles?" "'Yes, only I don't worry him with these things. It's better to write him merry letters, and cheer him up among the black folk. You repeated ever married a little while ago. Do you know, Molly, I don't think I ever shall be married to him. I don't know why, but I have a strong presentiment, so it's just as well not to tell him all my secrets, for it would be awkward for him to know them if it never came off." Molly dropped her work and sat silent, looking into the future. At length she said, "'I think it would break his heart, Cynthia.' "'Nonsense! Why, I'm sure that Mr. Cox came here with the intention of falling in love with you. You needn't blush so violently. I'm sure you saw it as plainly as I did, only you made yourself disagreeable, and I took pity on him, and consoled his wounded vanity.' "'Can you? Do you dare to compare Roger Hamley to Mr. Cox?' asked Molly indignantly. "'No. No, I don't said Cynthia in a moment. They are as different as men can be. Don't be so dreadfully serious over everything, Molly. You look as oppressed with sad reproach as if I had been passing on to you the scolding your father gave me." "'Because I don't think you value Roger as you ought, Cynthia,' said Molly stoutly, for it required a good deal of courage to force herself to say this, although she could not tell why she shrank so from speaking. "'Yes, I do. It's not in my nature to go into ecstasies, and I don't suppose I shall ever be what people call in love. But I am glad he loves me, and I like to make him happy, and I think him the best and most agreeable man I know, always excepting your father, when he isn't angry with me. What can I say more, Molly? Would you like me to say I think him handsome?" "'I know most people think him plain, but—well, I'm of the opinion of most people, then, and small blame to them. But I like his face. Oh, ten thousand times better than Mr. Preston's handsomeness!" For the first time during the conversation Cynthia seemed thoroughly in earnest. Why Mr. Preston was introduced neither she nor Molly knew. It came up and out by a sudden impulse. But a fierce look came into the eyes, and the soft lips contracted themselves as Cynthia named his name. Molly had noticed this look before, always at the mention of this one person. Cynthia. What makes you dislike Mr. Preston so much?" "'Don't you? Why do you ask me?' "'And yet, Molly,' said she, suddenly relaxing into depression, not merely in tone and look, but in the droop of her limbs, "'Molly, what should you think of me if I married him after all?' "'Married him? Has he ever asked you?' 
But Cynthia, instead of replying to this question, went on uttering her own thoughts. "'More unlikely things have happened. Have you never heard of strong wills mesmerizing weaker ones into submission? One of the girls at Madame Lefebvre's went out as a governess to a Russian family, who lived near Moscow. I sometimes think I'll write to her to find me a situation in Russia, just to get out of the daily chance of seeing that man." "'But sometimes you seem quite intimate with him, and talk to him." "'How can I help it?' said Cynthia impatiently. Then recovering herself, she added, "'We knew him so well at Ashcombe, and he's not a man to be easily thrown off, I can tell you. I must be civil to him. It's not from liking, and he knows it's not, for I've told him so. However, we won't talk about him. I don't know how he came to do it, I'm sure. The mere fact of his existence and of his being within half a mile of us is bad enough. Oh, I wish Roger was at home and rich and could marry me at once, and carry me away from that man. If I'd thought of it, I really believe I would have taken poor red-haired Mr. Cox." "'I don't understand it at all,' said Molly. "'I dislike Mr. Preston, but I should never think of taking such violent steps as you speak of to get away from the neighbourhood in which he lives.' "'No, because you are a reasonable little darling,' said Cynthia, resuming her usual manner and coming up to Molly and kissing her. "'At least you'll acknowledge that I'm a good hater.' "'Yes, but I still don't understand it. Oh, never mind. There are old complications with our affairs at Ashcombe. Money matters are at the root of it all. Horrid poverty! Do let us talk of something else. Or better still, let me go and finish my letter to Roger, or I shall be too late for the African mail. Isn't it gone? Oh, I ought to have reminded you. It will be too late. Did you not see the notice at the post-office that letters ought to be in London on the morning of the tenth instead of the evening? Oh, I am so sorry. So am I. But it can't be helped. It is to be hoped it will be the greater treat when he does get it. I've a far greater weight on my heart, because your father seems so displeased with me. I was fond of him, and now he is making me quite a coward. You see, Molly," continued she, a little piteously, I've never lived with people with such a high standard of conduct before, and I don't know quite how to behave." "'You must learn,' said Molly tenderly. You'll find Roger quite as strict in his notions of right and wrong." "'Ah, but he's in love with me,' said Cynthia, with a pretty consciousness of her power. Molly turned away her head and was silent. It was of no use combating the truth, and she tried rather not to feel it. Not to feel, poor girl, that she too had a great weight on her heart, into the cause of which she shrank from examining. That whole winter long she had felt as if her sun was all shrouded over with grey mist, and could no longer shine brightly for her. She wakened up in the morning with a dull sense of something being wrong. The world was out of joint, and if she were born to set it right, she did not know how to do it. Blind herself as she would, she could not help perceiving that her father was not satisfied with the wife he had chosen. For a long time Molly had been surprised at his apparent contentment. Sometimes she had been unselfish enough to be glad that he was satisfied, but still more frequently nature would have its way, and she was almost irritated at what she considered his blindness. Something, however, had changed him now, something that had arisen at the time of Cynthia's engagement. He had become nervously sensitive to his wife's failings, and his whole manner had grown dry and sarcastic, not merely to her, but also to Cynthia, and even, but this very rarely, to Molly herself. He was not a man to go into passions or ebullitions of feeling. They would have relieved him, even while degrading him in his own eyes. But he became hard, and occasionally bitter in his speeches and ways. Molly now learnt to long after the vanished blindness in which her father had passed the first year of his marriage, yet there were no outrageous infractions of domestic peace. Some people might say that Mr. Gibson accepted the inevitable. He told himself, in more homely phrase, that it was no use crying over spilt milk and he, from principle, avoided all actual dissensions with his wife, preferring to cut short a discussion by a sarcasm or by leaving the room. Moreover, Mrs. Gibson had a very tolerable temper of her own, and her cat-like nature purred and delighted in smooth ways, and a pleasant quietness. She had no great facility for understanding sarcasm. It is true it disturbed her, but as she was not quick at deciphering any depth of meaning, and felt it unpleasant to think about it, she forgot it as soon as possible. Yet she saw she was often in some kind of disfavour with her husband, and it made her uneasy. She resembled Cynthia in this. She liked to be liked, and she wanted to regain the esteem which she did not perceive she had lost for ever. 
Molly sometimes took her stepmother's part in secret. She felt as if she herself could never have borne her father's hard speeches so patiently. They would have cut her to the heart, and she must either have demanded an explanation, and probed the sore to the bottom, or sat down despairing and miserable. Instead of which Mrs. Gibson, after her husband had left the room, on these occasions would say in a manner more bewildered than hurt, "'I think dear papa seems a little put out to-day. We must see that he has a dinner that he likes when he comes home. I have often perceived that everything depends on making a man comfortable in his own house.' And thus she went on, groping about to find the means of reinstating herself in his good graces, really trying, according to her lights, till Molly was often compelled to pity her in spite of herself, and although she saw that her stepmother was the cause of her father's increased astringency of disposition. For, indeed, he had got into that kind of exaggerated susceptibility with regard to his wife's faults, which may best be typified by the state of bodily irritation that is produced by the constant recurrence of any particular noise. Those who are brought within hearing of it are apt to be always on the watch for the repetition, if they are once made to notice it, and are in an irritable state of nerves. So that poor Molly had not passed a cheerful winter, independently of any private sorrows that she might have in her own heart. She did not look well, either. She was gradually falling into low health, rather than bad health. Her heart beat more feebly and slower. The vivifying stimulant of hope, even unacknowledged hope, was gone out of her life. It seemed as if there was not, and never could be in this world, any help for the dumb discordancy between her father and his wife. Day after day, month after month, year after year, would Molly have to sympathize with her father and pity her stepmother, feeling acutely for both, and certainly more than Mrs. Gibson felt for herself. Molly could not imagine how she had at one time wished for her father's eyes to be opened, and how she could ever have fancied that if they were, he would be able to change things in Mrs. Gibson's character. It was all hopeless, and the only attempt at a remedy was to think about it as little as possible. Then Cynthia's ways and manners about Roger gave Molly a great deal of uneasiness. She did not believe that Cynthia cared enough for him, at any rate, not with the sort of love that she herself would have bestowed, if she had been so happy. No, that was not it, if she had been in Cynthia's place. She felt as if she should have gone to him both hands held out, full and brimming over with tenderness, and been grateful for every word of precious confidence bestowed on her. Yet Cynthia received his letters with a kind of carelessness, and read them with a strange indifference, while Molly sat at her feet, so to speak, looking up at her with eyes as wistful as a dog's waiting for crumbs, and such chance beneficence. She tried to be patient on these occasions, but at last she must ask, "'Where is he, Cynthia? What does he say?' By this time Cynthia had put down the letter on the table by her, smiling a little from time to time, as she remembered the loving compliments it contained. "'Where? Oh, I didn't look exactly. Somewhere in Abyssinia. Huon. I can't read the word, and it doesn't much signify, for it would give me no idea.' "'Is he well?' asked greedy Molly. "'Yes, now. He has had a slight touch of fever, he says, but it's all over now, and he hopes he is getting acclimatized.' "'A fever? And who took care of him? He would want nursing, and so far from home. Oh, Cynthia!' "'Oh, I don't fancy he had any nursing, poor fellow. One doesn't expect nursing and hospitals and doctors in Abyssinia. But he had plenty of quinine with him, and I suppose that is the best specific. At any rate, he says he is quite well now.' Molly sat silent for a minute or two. "'What is the date of the letter, Cynthia?' "'I didn't look. December the—December the tenth. "'That's nearly two months ago,' said Molly. Yes, but I determined I wouldn't worry myself with useless anxiety when he went away, if anything did—go wrong, you know," said Cynthia, using a euphemism for death, as most people do. It is an ugly word to speak plain out in the midst of life. It would be all over before I even heard of his illness, and I could be of no use to him. Could I, Molly?" No, I dare say it is all very true, only I should think the squire could not take it so easily. I always write him a little note when I hear from Roger, but I don't think I'll name this touch of fever. Shall I, Molly?" "'I don't know,' said Molly. "'People say one ought, but I almost wish I hadn't heard it. Please, does he say anything else that I may hear?' "'Oh, lovers' letters are so silly, and I think this is sillier than usual,' said Cynthia, looking over her letter again. "'Here's a piece you may read, from that line to that,' indicating two places. 
I haven't read it myself, for it looked dullish, all about Aristotle and Pliny, and I want to get this bonnet cap made up before we go out to pay our calls." Molly took the letter, the thought crossing her mind that he had touched it, had had his hands upon it in those far distant desert lands, where he might be lost to sight and to any human knowledge of his fate. Even now her pretty brown fingers almost caressed the flimsy paper with their delicacy of touch as she read. She saw references made to books, which with a little trouble would be accessible to her here in Hollingford. Perhaps the details and the references would make the letter dull and dry to some people, but not to her, thanks to his former teaching and the interest he had excited in her for his pursuits. But, as he said in apology, what had he to write about in that savage land but his love, and his researches, and travels? There was no society, no gaiety, no new books to write about, no gossip in Abyssinian wilds. Molly was not in strong health, and perhaps this made her a little fanciful, but certain it is that her thoughts by day and her dreams by night were haunted by the idea of Roger lying ill and untended in those savage lands. Her constant prayer, O oh my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it, came from a heart as true as that of the real mother in King Solomon's judgment. Let him live, let him live, even though I may never set eyes upon him again. Have pity upon his father, grant that he may come home safe, and live happily with her whom he loves so tenderly, so tenderly, O oh God!" And then she would burst into tears, and drop asleep at last, sobbing. End of chapter 37 Wives and Daughters. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell. Chapter 38. Mr. Kirkpatrick, Q.C. Cynthia was always the same with Molly, kind, sweet-tempered, ready to help, professing a great deal of love for her, and probably feeling as much as she did for any one in the world. But Molly had reached to this superficial depth of affection and intimacy in the first few weeks of Cynthia's residence in her father's house, and if she had been of a nature prone to analyse the character of one whom she loved dearly, she might have perceived that, with all Cynthia's apparent frankness, there were certain limits beyond which her confidence did not go. Where her reserve began, and her real self was shrouded in mystery. For instance, her relations with Mr. Preston were often very puzzling to Molly. She was sure that there had been a much greater intimacy between them formerly at Ashcombe, and that the remembrance of this was often very galling and irritating to Cynthia, who was as evidently desirous of forgetting it as he was anxious to make her remember it. But why this intimacy had ceased, why Cynthia disliked him so extremely now, and many other unexplained circumstances connected with these two facts, were Cynthia's secrets. And she effectually baffled all Molly's innocent attempts during the first glow of her friendship for Cynthia, to learn the girlish antecedents of her companion's life. Every now and then Molly came to a dead wall beyond which she could not pass, at least with the delicate instruments which were all she chose to use. Perhaps Cynthia might have told all there was to tell to a more forcible curiosity, which knew how to improve every slip of the tongue and every fit of temper to its own gratification. But Molly's was the interest of affection, not the coarser desire of knowing everything for a little excitement and as soon as she saw that Cynthia did not wish to tell her anything about that period of her life, Molly left off referring to it. But if Cynthia had preserved a sweet tranquillity of manner and an unvarying kindness for Molly during the winter of which there is question, at present she was the only person to whom the beauty's ways were unchanged. Mr. Gibson's influence had been good for her as long as she saw that he liked her. She had tried to keep as high a place in his good opinion as she could and had curbed many a little sarcasm against her mother, and many a twisting of the absolute truth when he was by. Now there was a constant uneasiness about her, which made her more cowardly than before, and even her partisan, Molly, could not help being aware of the distinct equivocations she occasionally used when anything in Mr. Gibson's words or behaviour pressed her too hard. Her repartees to her mother were less frequent than they had been, 
but there was often the unusual phenomenon of pettishness in her behaviour to her. These changes in humour and disposition, here described all at once, were in themselves a series of delicate alterations of relative conduct spread over many months, many winter months of long evenings and bad weather, which bring out discords of character, as a dash of cold water brings out the fading colours of an old fresco. During much of this time Mr. Preston had been at Ashcombe, for Lord Cumnor had not been able to find an agent whom he liked to replace Mr. Preston, and while the inferior situation remained vacant, Mr. Preston had undertaken to do the duties of both. Mrs. Goodenough had had a serious illness, and the little society at Hollingford did not care to meet while one of their habitual set was scarcely out of danger. So there had been very little visiting, and though Miss Browning said that the absence of the temptations of society was very agreeable to cultivated minds, after the dissipations of the previous autumn, when there were parties every week to welcome Mr. Preston, yet Miss Phoebe let out in confidence that she and her sister had fallen into the habit of going to bed at nine o'clock, for they found cribbage night after night, from five o'clock till ten, rather too much of a good thing. To tell the truth, that winter, if peaceful, was monotonous in Hollingford, and the whole circle of gentility there was delighted to be stirred up in March by the intelligence that Mr. Kirkpatrick, the newly made Q.C., was coming on a visit for a couple of days to his sister-in-law, Mrs. Gibson. Mrs. Goodenough's room was the very centre of gossip. Gossip had been her daily bread through her life. Gossip was meat and wine to her now. "'Dear ah me said the old lady, rousing herself so as to sit upright in her easy-chair, and propping herself with her hands on the arms. "'Who would have thought she'd such grand relations? Why, Mr. Ashton told me once that a Queen's Council was as like to be a judge as a kitten is like to be a cat. And to think of her being as good as a sister to a judge! I saw one once, and I know I thought as I shouldn't wish for a better winter cloak than his old robes would make me, if I could only find out where I could get him second-hand and I know she'd her silk gowns turned and dyed and cleaned, for aught I know, turned again while she lived at Ashcombe. Keeping a school, too, and so near akin to this Queen's Council all the time. Well, to be sure, it wasn't much of a school, only ten young ladies at the best of times, so perhaps he never heard of it." "'I've been wondering what they'll give him to dinner,' said Miss Browning. "'It is an unlucky time for visitors. No game to be had, and lamb so late this year, and chicken hardly to be had for love or money." "'He'll have to put up with calf's head, that he will,' said Mrs. Goodenough solemnly. "'If I'd a got my usual health, I'd copy out a receipt of my grandmother's for a rolled calf's head, and send it to Mrs. Gibson. The doctor has been very kind to me all through this illness. I wish my daughter in Cumbermere would send me some autumn chickens. I'd pass them on to the doctor, that I would but she's been a-killing of em all, and sending them to me, and the last she sent she wrote me word was the last." "'I wonder if they'll give a party for him,' suggested Miss Phoebe. "'I should like to see a Queen's Council for one in my life. I have seen javelin men, but that's the greatest thing in the legal line I ever came across." "'They'll ask Mr. Ashton, of course,' said Miss Browning. The three black graces, law, physic, and divinity, as the song calls them, whenever there's a second course there's always the clergyman of the parish invited in any family of gentility." "'I wonder if he's married,' said Mrs. Goodenough. Miss Phoebe had been feeling the same wonder, but had not thought it maidenly to express it even to her sister, who was the source of knowledge, having met Mrs. Gibson in the street on her way to Mrs. Goodenough's. Yes, he's married, and must have several children, for Mrs. Gibson said that Cynthia Kirkpatrick had paid them a visit in London, to have lessons with her cousins. And she said that his wife was a most accomplished woman, and of good family, though she brought him no fortune. It's a very creditable connection, I'm sure. It's only a wonder to me as how we've had so little talk of it before," said Mrs. Goodenough. At the first look of the thing I shouldn't have thought Mrs. Gibson was one to hide away her fine relations under a bushel. Indeed, for that matter, were all of us fond of turning the best breadth of the gown to the front. I remember, speaking of breadths, how I've undone my skirts many a time and off to put a stain or a grease spot next to poor Mr. Goodenough. He'd a soft kind of heart when first we was married, and he said, says he, Patty, link thy right arm unto my left one, then thou'lt be nearer to my heart.' 
and so we kept up the habit, when poor man need a deal more to think on than romancing on which side his art lay, so as I said, I always put my damaged breaths on the right hand, and when we walked arm in arm, as we always did, no one was ever the wiser. "'I should not be surprised if he invited Cynthia to pay him another visit in London,' said Miss Browning. "'If he did it when he was poor, he's twenty times more likely to do it now he's a Queen's Council. "'Aye, work it by the rule of three, and she stands a good chance. I only hope it won't turn her head. Going up visiting in London at her age. Why, I was fifty before I ever went.' "'But she has been in France. She's quite a travelled young lady,' said Miss Phoebe. Mrs. Goodenough shook her head for a whole minute before she gave vent to her opinion. "'It's a risk,' said she, "'a great risk. I don't like saying so to the doctor, but I shouldn't like having my daughter if I was him, so cheek by jowl with a girl as was brought up in the country where Robespierre and Bonaparte was born.' "'But Bonaparte was a Corsican,' said Miss Browning, who was much farther advanced both in knowledge and in liberality of opinions than Mrs. Goodenough and there's a great opportunity for cultivation of the mind afforded by intercourse with foreign countries. I always admire Cynthia's grace of manner, never too shy to speak, yet never putting herself forwards. She's quite a help to a party, and if she has a few airs and graces, why, they're natural at her age. Now as for dear Molly, there's a kind of awkwardness about her. She broke one of our best china cups last time she was at party at our house, and spilt the coffee on the new carpet and then she got so confused that she hardly did anything but sit in a corner and hold her tongue all the rest of the evening. "'She was so sorry for what she'd done, sister,' said Miss Phoebe, in a gentle tone of reproach. She was always faithful to Molly. "'Well, and did I say she wasn't? But was there any need for her to be stupid all the evening after?' "'But you were rather sharp, rather displeased.' and I think it my duty to be sharp, I and cross too, when I see young folks careless, and when I see my duty clear I do it. I'm not one to shrink from it, and they ought to be grateful to me. It's not every one that will take the trouble of reproving them, as Mrs. Goodenough knows. I'm very fond of Molly Gibson, very, for her own sake, and for her mother's too. I'm not sure if I don't think she's worth half a dozen Cynthia's, but for all that she shouldn't break my best china teacup, and then sit doing nothing for her livelihood all the rest of the evening." By this time Mrs. Goodenough gave evident signs of being tired. Molly's misdemeanours and Miss Browning's broken teacup were not as exciting subjects of conversation as Mrs. Gibson's newly discovered good luck in having a successful London lawyer for a relation. Mr. Kirkpatrick had been, like many other men, struggling on in his profession, and encumbered with a large family of his own. He was ready to do a good turn for his connections, if it occasioned him no loss of time, and if, which was perhaps a primary condition, he remembered their existence. Cynthia's visit to Doughty Street nine or ten years ago had not made much impression upon him, after he had once suggested its feasibility to his good-natured wife. He was even rather startled every now and then by the appearance of a pretty little girl amongst his own children, as they trooped in to dessert, and he had to remind himself who she was. But as it was his custom to leave the table almost immediately, and to retreat into a small back room called his study, to immerse himself in papers for the rest of the evening, the child had not made much impression upon him, and probably the next time he remembered her existence was when Mrs. Kirkpatrick wrote to him to beg him to receive Cynthia for a night on her way to school at Boulogne. The same request was repeated on her return, but it so happened that he had not seen her either time, and only dimly remembered some remarks which his wife had made on one of those occasions, that it seemed to her rather hazardous to send so young a girl on so long a journey without making more provision for her safety than Mrs. Kirkpatrick had done. He knew that his wife would fill up all deficiencies in this respect as if Cynthia had been her own daughter, and thought no more about her until he received an invitation to attend Mrs. Kirkpatrick's wedding with Mr. Gibson, the highly esteemed surgeon of Hollingford, etc., etc., an attention which irritated instead of pleasing him. "'Does the woman think I have nothing to do but run about the country in search of brides and bridegrooms, when this great case of Houghton B. Houghton is coming on, and I haven't a moment to spare?' he asked of his wife. "'Perhaps she never heard of it,' suggested Mrs. Kirkpatrick. "'Nonsense! The case has been in the papers for days.' "'But she mayn't know you are engaged in it.' "'She mayn't,' said he meditatively. 
such ignorance was possible. But now the great case of Houghton versus Houghton was a thing of the past. The hard struggle was over, the comparative table-land of Q.C.dom gained, and Mr. Kirkpatrick had leisure for family feeling and recollection. One day in the Easter vacation he found himself near Hollingford. He had a Sunday to spare, and he wrote to offer himself as a visitor to the Gibsons from Friday till Monday, expressing strongly, what he really felt in a less degree, his wish to make Mr. Gibson's acquaintance. Mr. Gibson, though often overwhelmed with professional business, was always hospitable, and moreover it was always a pleasure to him to get out of the somewhat confined mental atmosphere which he had breathed over and over again, and have a whiff of fresh air, a glimpse of what was passing in the great world beyond his daily limits of thought and action. So he was ready to give a cordial welcome to his unknown relation. Mrs. Gibson was in a flutter of sentimental delight, which she fancied was family affection, but which might not have been quite so effervescent, if Mr. Kirkpatrick had remained in his former position of struggling lawyer, with seven children, living in Doughty Street. When the two gentlemen met they were attracted towards each other by a similarity of character, with just enough difference in their opinions to make the experience of each, on which the opinions were based, valuable to the other. To Mrs. Gibson, although the bond between them counted for very little in their intercourse, Mr. Kirkpatrick paid very polite attention, and was in fact very glad that she had done so well for herself as to marry a sensible and agreeable man, who was able to keep her in comfort, and to behave to her daughter in so liberal a manner. Molly struck him as a delicate-looking girl, who might be very pretty if she had a greater look of health and animation. Indeed, looking at her critically, there were beautiful points about her face long soft grey eyes, black curling eyelashes, rarely showing dimples, perfect teeth, but there was a languor over all, a slow depression of manner, which contrasted unfavourably with the brightly coloured Cynthia, sparkling, quick, graceful, and witty. As Mr. Kirkpatrick expressed it afterwards to his wife, he was quite in love with that girl, and Cynthia, as ready to captivate strangers as any little girl of three or four, rose to the occasion forgot all her cares and despondencies, remembered no longer her regret at having lost something of Mr. Gibson's good opinion, and listened eagerly and made soft replies, intermixed with naive sallies of droll humour, till Mr. Kirkpatrick was quite captivated. He left Hollingford almost surprised to have performed a duty and found it a pleasure. For Mrs. Gibson and Molly he had a general friendly feeling, but he did not care if he never saw them again. But for Mr. Gibson he had a warm respect, a strong personal liking, which he should be glad to have ripen into a friendship, if there was time for it in this bustling world. And he fully resolved to see more of Cynthia. His wife must know her, they must have her up to stay with them in London, and show her something of the world. But on returning home Mr. Kirkpatrick found so much work awaiting him that he had to lock up embryo friendships and kindly plans in some safe closet of his mind and give himself up, body and soul, to the immediate work of his profession. But in May he found time to take his wife to the Academy exhibition, and some portrait there striking him as being like Cynthia, he told his wife more about her and his visit to Hollingford than he had ever had leisure to do before, and the result was that on the next day a letter was sent off to Mrs. Gibson, inviting Cynthia to pay a visit to her cousins in London, and reminding her of many little circumstances that had occurred when she was with them as a child, so as to carry on the clue of friendship from that time to the present. On its receipt this letter was greeted in various ways by the four people who sat round the breakfast-table. Mrs. Gibson read it to herself first. Then, without telling what its contents were, so that her auditors were quite in the dark as to what her remarks applied, she said, I think they might have remembered that I am a generation nearer to them than she is. But nobody thinks of family affection nowadays. And I liked him so much, and bought a new cookery book, all to make it pleasant and agreeable, and what he was used to." She said all this in a plaintive, aggrieved tone of voice, but as no one knew to what she was referring, it was difficult to offer her consolation. Her husband was the first to speak. "'If you want us to sympathise with you, tell us what is the nature of your woe. Why, I dare say it's what he means is a very kind attention, only I think I ought to have been asked before Cynthia," said she, reading the letter over again. "'Who's he? And what's meant for a kind attention?' "'Mr. Kirkpatrick, to be sure. This letter is from him. 
and he wants Cynthia to go and pay them a visit, and he never says anything about you or me, my dear. And I'm sure we did our best to make it pleasant, and he should have asked us first, I think. As I couldn't possibly have gone, it makes very little difference to me. But I could have gone, and at any rate he should have paid us the compliment. It's only a proper mark of respect, you know. So ungrateful, too, when I gave up my dressing-room on purpose for him. And I dressed for dinner every day he was here, if we are each to recapitulate all our sacrifices on his behalf. But for all that I didn't expect to be invited to his house. I shall be only too glad if you will come again to mine." "'I've a great mind not to let Cynthia go,' said Mrs. Gibson reflectively. "'I can't go, mamma," said Cynthia, colouring. "'My gowns are all so shabby, and my old bonnet must do for the summer.' "'Well, but you can buy a new one, and I'm sure it is high time you should get yourself another silk gown. You must have been saving up a great deal, for I don't know when you've had any new clothes.' Cynthia began to say something, but stopped short. She went on buttering her toast, but she held it in her hand without eating it, without looking up, either, as after a minute or two of silence she spoke again. "'I cannot go. I should like it very much, but I really cannot go. Please, mamma, write at once and refuse it.' "'Nonsense, child! When a man in Mr. Kirkpatrick's position comes forward to offer a favour, it does not do to decline it without giving it a sufficient response. So kind of him as it is, too!' "'Suppose you offer to go instead of me,' proposed Cynthia. "'No, no, that won't do,' said Mr. Gibson decidedly. "'You can't transfer invitations in that way. But really this excuse about your clothes does appear to be very trivial, Cynthia, if you have no other reason to give.' "'It is a real true reason to me,' said Cynthia, looking up at him as she spoke. "'You must let me judge for myself. It would not do to go there in a state of shabbiness, for even in Doughty Street, I remember, my aunt was very particular about dress. And now that Margaret and Helen are grown up, and they visit so much, pray don't say anything more about it, for I know it would not do.' "'What have you done with all your money, I wonder?' asked Mrs. Gibson. You've twenty pounds a year, thanks to Mr. Gibson and me, and I'm sure you haven't spent more than ten. I hadn't many things when I came back from France," said Cynthia, in a low voice, and evidently troubled by all this questioning. Pray let it be decided at once. I can't go, and there's an end of it." She got up and left the room rather suddenly. "'I don't understand it at all,' said Mrs. Gibson. "'Do you, Molly?' "'No, I know she doesn't like spending money on her dress, and is very careful.' Molly said this much, and then was afraid she had made mischief. "'But then she must have got the money somewhere. It always has struck me that if you have not extravagant habits, and do not live up to your income, you must have a certain sum to lay by at the end of the year. Have I not often said so, Mr. Gibson?' "'Probably.' "'Well, then, apply the same reasoning to Cynthia's case, and then I ask what has become of the money.' "'I cannot tell,' said Molly, seeing she was appealed to. "'She may have given it away to some one who wants it.' Mr. Gibson put down his newspaper. "'It's very clear that she has neither got the dress nor the money necessary for this London visit, and that she doesn't want any more inquiries to be made on the subject. She likes mysteries, in fact, and I detest them. Still, I think it's a desirable thing for her to keep up the acquaintance, or friendship, or whatever it is to be called, with her father's family, and I shall gladly give her ten pounds, and if that's not enough, why either you must help her out, or she must do without some superfluous article of dress or another." "'I'm sure there was never such a kind, dear, generous man as you are, Mr. Gibson,' said his wife, "'to think of your being a stepfather, and so good to my poor fatherless girl. But, Molly, my dear, I think you'll acknowledge that you too are very fortunate in your stepmother. Are you not, love? And what happy tete-a-tetes we shall have together when Cynthia goes to London! I'm not sure I don't get on better with you even than with her, though she is my own child, for as dear papa says so truly, there is a love of mystery about her, and if I hate anything it is the slightest concealment or reserve. Ten pounds! Why, it will quite set her up! buy her a couple of gowns and a new bonnet, and I don't know at all. Dear Mr. Gibson, how generous you are!" Something very like, pshaw, was growled out from behind the newspaper. "'May I go and tell her?' said Molly, rising up. "'Yes, do, love. 
Tell her to be so ungrateful to refuse, and tell her that your father wishes her to go, and tell her too that it would be quite wrong not to avail herself of an opening which may by and by be extended to the rest of the family. I am sure if they ask me, which certainly they ought to do, I won't say before they asked Cynthia, because I never think of myself, and am really the most forgiving person in the world in forgiving slights, but when they do ask me, which they are sure to do, I shall never be content till, by putting in a little hint here and there, I have induced them to send you an invitation. A month or two in London would do you so much good, Molly." Molly had left the room before this speech was ended, and Mr. Gibson was occupied with his newspaper but Mrs. Gibson finished it to herself very much to her own satisfaction. For, after all, it was better to have some one of the family going on the visit, though she might not be the right person, than to refuse it altogether, and never to have the opportunity of saying anything about it. As Mr. Gibson was so kind to Cynthia, she too would be kind to Molly, and dress her becomingly, and invite young men to the house, do all the things in fact which Molly and her father did not want to have done, and throw the old stumbling-blocks in the way of their unrestrained intercourse, which was the one thing they desired to have, free and open, and without the constant dread of her jealousy. End of chapter 38 Wives and Daughters This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell Chapter Thirty Nine Secret Thoughts Ooze Out Molly found Cynthia in the drawing room, standing in the bow window, looking out on the garden. She started as Molly came up to her. Oh, Molly, she said, putting her arms out towards her, I am always so glad to have you with me. It was outbursts of affection such as these that always called Molly back, if she had been ever so unconsciously wavering in her allegiance to Cynthia. She had been wishing downstairs that Cynthia would be less reserved, and not have so many secrets. But now it seemed almost like treason to have wanted her to be anything but what she was. Never had any one more than Cynthia the power spoken of by Goldsmith when he wrote, He threw off his friends like a huntsman his pack for he knew when he liked he could whistle them back. "'Do you know, I think you'll be glad to hear what I've got to tell you,' said Molly. "'I think you would really like to go to London, shouldn't you?' "'Yes, but it's of no use liking,' said Cynthia. "'Don't you begin about it, Molly, for the thing is settled, and I can't tell you why, but I can't go.' "'It is only the money, dear, and Papa has been so kind about it. He wants you to go.' He thinks you ought to keep up relationships, and he is going to give you ten pounds." "'How kind he is,' said Cynthia. "'But I ought not to take it. I wish I had known you years ago. I should have been different to what I am." "'Never mind that. We like you as you are. We don't want you different. You'll really hurt Papa if you don't take it. Why do you hesitate? Do you think Roger won't like it?' "'Roger!' No, I wasn't thinking about him. Why should he care? I shall be there and back again before he even hears about it." "'Then you will go,' said Molly. Cynthia thought for a minute or two. "'Yes, I will,' said she at length. "'I dare say it's not wise, but it will be pleasant, and I'll go. Where is Mr. Gibson? I want to thank him. Oh, how kind he is! Molly, you're a lucky girl." I said Molly, quite startled at being told this, for she had been feeling as if so many things were going wrong, almost as if they would never go right again. "'There he is,' said Cynthia. "'I hear him in the hall.' And down she flew, and laying her hands on Mr. Gibson's arm, she thanked him with such warm impulsiveness and in so pretty and caressing a manner that something of his old feeling of personal liking for her returned and he forgot for a time the causes of disapproval he had against her. "'There, there,' said he, "'that's enough, my dear. It's quite right you should keep up with your relations. There's nothing more to be said about it.' "'I do think your father is the most charming man I know,' said Cynthia on her return to Molly, "'and it's that which always makes me so afraid of losing his good opinion, and fret so when I think he is displeased with me.' And now let us think all about this London visit. 
It will be delightful, won't it? I can make ten pounds go ever so far, and in some ways it will be such a comfort to get out of Hollingford." "'Will it?' said Molly, rather wistfully. "'Oh, yes. You know I don't mean that it will be a comfort to leave you. That will be anything but a comfort. But after all, a country town is a country town, and London is London. You need not smile at my truisms. I've always had a sympathy with Monsieur de la Palisse. Monsieur de la Palisse est mort, en perdant sa vie. Un quart d'heure avant sa mort, il était en vie," sang she, in so gay a manner that she puzzled Molly, as she often did by her change of mood from the gloomy decision with which she had refused to accept the invitation only half an hour ago. She suddenly took Molly round the waist, and began waltzing round the room with her, to the imminent danger of the various little tables, loaded with objets d'art, as Mrs. Gibson delighted to call them, with which the drawing-room was crowded. She avoided them, however, with her usual skill, but they both stood still at last, surprised at Mrs. Gibson's surprise, as she stood at the door, looking at the whirl going on before her. "'Upon my word, I only hope you are not going crazy, both of you. What's all this about, pray?' "'Only because I'm so glad I'm going to London, mamma," said Cynthia demurely. I'm not sure if it's quite the thing for an engaged young lady to be so much beside herself at the prospect of gaiety. In my time, our great pleasure in our lover's absence was in thinking about them. I should have thought that would have given you pain, because you would have had to remember that they were away, which ought to have made you unhappy. Now to tell the truth, just at the moment I had forgotten all about Roger. I hope it wasn't very wrong. Osborne looks as if he did all my share as well as his own of the fretting after Roger. How ill he looked yesterday!" "'Yes,' said Molly. I didn't know if any one besides me had noticed it. I was quite shocked." "'Ah,' said Mrs. Gibson, "'I'm afraid that young man won't live long. Very much afraid.' And she shook her head ominously. "'Oh, what will happen if he dies?' exclaimed Molly suddenly sitting down and thinking of that strange, mysterious wife who never made her appearance, whose very existence was never spoken about, and Roger away, too. "'Well, it would be very sad, of course, and we should all feel it very much, I've no doubt, for I've always been very fond of Osborne. In fact, before Roger became, as it were, my own flesh and blood, I liked Osborne better. But we must not forget the living, dear Molly.' for Molly's eyes were filling with tears at the dismal thoughts presented to her. "'Our dear good Roger would, I am sure, do all in his power to fill Osborne's place in every way, and his marriage need not be so long delayed.' "'Don't speak of that in the same breath as Osborne's life, mamma," said Cynthia hastily. "'Why, my dear, it is a very natural thought. For poor Roger's sake, you know, one wishes it not to be so very, very long an engagement and I was only answering Molly's question, after all. One can't help following out one's thoughts. People must die, you know, young as well as old." "'If I ever suspected Roger of following out his thoughts in a similar way,' said Cynthia, "'I'd never speak to him again.' "'As if he would,' said Molly, warm in her turn. "'You know he never would, and you shouldn't suppose it of him, Cynthia. No, not for even a moment.' "'I can't see the great harm of it all for my part,' said Mrs. Gibson plaintively. "'A young man strikes us all as looking very ill, and I'm sure I'm sorry for it. But illness very often leads to death. Surely you agree with me there, and what's the harm of saying so? Then Molly asks what will happen if he dies, and I try to answer her question. I don't like talking or thinking of death any more than anyone else. But I should think myself wanting in strength of mind if I could not look forward to the consequences of death. I really think we're commanded to do so, somewhere in the Bible, or the prayer-book." "'Do you look forward to the consequences of my death, mamma? asked Cynthia. "'You really are the most unfeeling girl I have ever met with,' said Mrs. Gibson, really hurt. "'I wish I could give you a little of my own sensitiveness, for I have too much for my happiness. Don't let us speak of Osborne again. Ten to one it was only some temporary over-fatigue, or some anxiety about Roger, or perhaps a little fit of indigestion. I was very foolish to attribute it to anything more serious, and dear papa might be displeased if he knew I had done so. 
Medical men don't like other people to be making conjectures about health. They consider it as trenching on their own particular province, and very proper, I'm sure. Now, let us consider about your dress, Cynthia. I could not understand how you had spent your money, and made so little show with it. Mamma, it may sound very cross, but I must tell Molly and you and everybody once and for all, that as I don't want and didn't ask for any more than my allowance, I'm not going to answer any questions about what I do with it." She did not say this with any want of respect, but she said it with quiet determination, which subdued her mother for the time, though often afterwards, when Mrs. Gibson and Molly were alone, the former would start the wonder as to what Cynthia could possibly have done with her money, and hunt each poor conjecture through woods and valleys of doubt, till she was wearied out, and the exciting sport was given up for the day. At present, however, she confined herself to the practical matter in hand, and the genius for millinery and dress, inherent in both mother and daughter, soon settled a great many naughty points of contrivance and taste, and then they were all three set to work to gar old Clay's look amidst a wheels the new. Cynthia's relations with the squire had been very stationary ever since the visit she paid to the hall the previous autumn. He had received them all at that time with hospitable politeness, and he had been more charmed with Cynthia than he liked to acknowledge to himself when he thought the visit all over afterwards. "'She is a pretty lass, sure enough,' thought he, "'and has pretty ways about her, too, and likes to learn from older people, which is a good sign but somehow I don't like Madam her mother. But still she is her mother, and the girl's her daughter. Yet she spoke to her once or twice, as I shouldn't have liked our little Fanny to have spoken, if it had pleased God for her to have lived. No, it's not the right way, and it may be a bit old-fashioned, but I like the right way. And then again she took possession of me, as I may say, and little Molly had to run after us in the garden walks that are too narrow for three, just like a little four-legged doggy and the other was so full of listening to me she never turned round for her to speak a word to Molly. I don't mean to say they're not fond of each other, and that's in Roger's sweetheart's favour, and it's very ungrateful in me to go and find fault with a lass who was so civil to me, and had such a pretty way with her of hanging on every word that fell from my lips. Well, a deal may come and go in two years, and the lad says nothing to me about it. I'll be as deep as him, and take no more notice of the affair till he comes home and tells me himself." So, although the squire was always delighted to receive the little notes which Cynthia sent him every time she heard from Roger, and although this attention on her part was melting the heart he tried to harden, he controlled himself into writing her the briefest acknowledgments. His words were strong in meaning, but formal in expression. She herself did not think much about them, being satisfied to do the kind actions that called them forth. But her mother criticized them and pondered them. She thought she had hit on the truth when she decided in her own mind that it was a very old-fashioned style, and that he and his house and his furniture all wanted some of the brightening up and polishing which they were sure to receive when— She never quite liked to finish the sentence definitely, although she kept repeating to herself that, There was no harm in it. To return to the squire. Occupied as he now was, he recovered his former health, and something of his former cheerfulness. If Osborne had met him half-way, it is probable that the old bond between father and son might have been renewed. But Osborne either was really an invalid, or had sunk into invalid habits, and made no effort to rally. If his father urged him to go out—nay, once or twice he gulped down his pride and asked Osborne to accompany him—Osborne would go to the window and find out some flaw or speck in the wind and weather, and make that an excuse for stopping indoors over his books. He would saunter out on the sunny side of the house in a manner that the squire considered as both indolent and unmanly. Yet if there was a prospect of his leaving home, which he did pretty often about this time, he was seized with a hectic energy. The clouds in the sky, the easterly wind, the dampness of the air, were nothing to him then. And the squire did not know the real cause of this anxiety to be gone, he took it into his head that it arose from Osborne's dislike to Hamley, and to the monotony of his father's society. "'It was a mistake,' thought the squire. "'I see it now. I never was great at making friends myself. I always thought those Oxford and Cambridge men turned up their noses at me for a country booby, and I'd get the start and have none of them. But when the boys went to Rugby and Cambridge I should have let them have their own friends about them, even though they might have looked down on me.' It was the worst they could have done to me, 
and now what few friends I had had fallen off from me, by death or somehow, and it is but dreary work for a young man, I grant it. But he might try not to show it so plain to me as he does. I'm getting case-hardened, but it does cut me to the quick sometimes. It does. And he's so fond of his dad as he once was. If I can beget the land drained, I'll make him an allowance and let him go to London or where he likes. Maybe he'll do better this time. Or maybe he'll go to the dogs altogether. But perhaps it will make him think a bit kindly of the old father at home. I should like him to do that, I should." It is possible that Osborne might have been induced to tell his father of his marriage during their long, solitary intercourse, if the squire, in an unlucky moment, had not given him his confidence about Roger's engagement with Cynthia. It was on one wet Sunday afternoon, when the father and son were sitting together in the large, empty drawing-room. Osborne had not been to church in the morning. The squire had, and he was now trying hard to read one of Blair's sermons. They had dined early, they always did on Sundays, and either that, or the sermon, or the hopeless wetness of the day, made the afternoon seem interminably long to the squire. He had certain unwritten rules for the regulation of his conduct on Sundays. Cold meat, sermon-reading, no smoking till after evening prayers, as little thought as possible to the state of the land and the condition of the crops, and as much respectable sitting indoors in his best clothes, as was consistent with going to church twice a day, and saying the responses louder than the clerk. To-day it had rained so unceasingly that he had remitted the afternoon church. But, oh, even with the luxury of a nap, how long it seemed before he saw the hall servants trudging homewards along the field-path, a covey of umbrellas. He had been standing at the window for the last half-hour his hands in his pockets, and his mouth often contracting itself into the traditional sin of a whistle, but as often checked into sudden gravity, ending nine times out of ten in a yawn. He looked askance at Osborne, who was sitting near the fire absorbed in a book. The poor squire was something like the little boy in the child's story, who asks all sorts of birds and beasts to come and play with him, and in every case receives the sober answer that they are too busy to have leisure for trivial amusements. The father wanted the son to put down his book and talk to him. It was so wet, so dull, and a little conversation would so while away the time. But Osborne, with his back to the window where his father was standing, saw nothing of all this and went on reading. He had assented to his father's remark that it was a very wet afternoon, but had not carried on the subject into all the varieties of truisms of which it was susceptible. Something more rousing must be started, and this the squire felt. The recollection of the affair between Roger and Cynthia came into his head, and without giving it a moment's consideration he began, "'Osborne, do you know anything about this, this attachment of Roger's?' Quite successful. Osborne laid down his book in a moment and turned round to his father. "'Roger? In attachment? No, I never heard of it. I can hardly believe it. That is to say, I suppose it is to—' And then he stopped for he thought he had no right to betray his own conjecture that the object with Cynthia Kirkpatrick. "'Yes, he is, though. Can you guess who, too? Nobody that I particularly like. Not a connection, to my mind. Yet she's a very pretty girl, and I suppose I was to blame in the first instance.' "'Is it—there's no beating about the bush. I've gone so far I may as well tell you all. It's Miss Kirkpatrick, Gibson's stepdaughter. But it's not an engagement, mind you.' I'm very glad. I hope she likes Roger back again." "'Like? It's only too good a connection for her not to like it. If Roger is of the same mind when he comes home, I'll be bound she'll be only too happy." "'I wonder Roger never told me,' said Osborne, a little hurt now he began to consider himself. "'He never told me either,' said the squire. It was Gibson who came here and made a clean breast of it, like a man of honour. I'd been saying to him I couldn't have either of you two lads taking up with his lasses. I'll own it was you I was afraid of. It's bad enough with Roger, and maybe we'll come to nothing after all. But if it had been you, I'd have broken with Gibson and every mother's son of em, sooner than let him have it go on. And so I told Gibson." "'I beg your pardon for interrupting you. But once for all I claim the right of choosing my wife for myself, subject to no man's interference,' said Osborne hotly. "'Then you'll keep your wife with no man's interference, that's all. For ne'er a penny will you get from me, my lad, unless you marry to please me a little. 
as well as yourself, a great deal. That's all I ask of you. I'm not particular as to beauty or as to cleverness and piano-playing and that sort of thing. If Roger marries this girl, we shall have enough of that in the family. I shouldn't much mind her being a bit older than you, but she must be well born, and the more money she brings, the better for the old place." "'I say again, father, I choose my wife for myself, and I don't admit any man's right of dictation." "'Well, well,' said the squire, getting a little angry in his turn. "'If I'm not to be father in this matter, thou shan't be son. Go against me in what I've set my heart on, and you'll find there's the devil to pay, that's all. But don't let us get angry. It's Sunday afternoon, for one thing, and it's a sin. And besides that, I've not finished my story." For Osborne had taken up his book again, and under pretense of reading, was fuming to himself. He hardly put it away again, even at his father's request. "'As I was saying, Gibson said, when first we spoke about it, that there was nothing on foot between any of you four, and that if there was, he would let me know. So, by and by, he comes and tells me of this." "'Of what? I don't understand how far it has gone." There was a tone in Osborne's voice the squire did not like, and he began answering rather angrily. "'Of this, to be sure, of what I'm telling you, of Roger going and making love to this girl the day he left, after he had gone away from there, and he was waiting for the umpire in Hollingford. One would think you quite stupid at times, Osborne." "'I can only say that these details are quite new to me. You never mentioned them before, I assure you." "'Well, never mind whether I did or not. I'm sure I said Roger was attached to Miss Kirkpatrick, and be hanged to her, and you might have understood all the rest as a matter of course." "'Possibly,' said Osborne politely. "'May I ask if Miss Kirkpatrick, who appeared to me to be a very nice girl, responds to Roger's affection?' "'Fast enough, I'll be bound,' said the squire sulkily. "'A Hamley of Hamley isn't to be had every day. Now I'll tell you what, Osborne, you're the only marriageable one left in the market and I want to hoist the old family up again. Don't go against me in this. It really will break my heart if you do." "'Father, don't talk so,' said Osborne. "'I'll do anything I can to oblige you, except—' "'Except the only thing I've set my heart on your doing.' "'Well, well, let it alone for the present. There's no question of my marrying just at this moment. I'm out of health, and I'm not up to going into society, and meeting young ladies and all that sort of thing even if I had an opening into fitting society." "'You should have an opening fast enough. There'll be more money coming in in a year or two, please God. And as for your health, why, what's to make you well if you cower over the fire all day and shudder away from a good honest tankard as if it were poison?" "'So it is to me,' said Osborne languidly, playing with his book as if he wanted to end the conversation and take it up again. The squire saw the movements and understood them. "'Well,' said he. I'll go and have a talk with Will about poor old Black Bess. It's Sunday work enough, asking after a dumb animal's aches and pains." But after his father had left the room, Osborne did not take up his book again. He laid it down on the table by him, leant back in his chair, and covered his eyes with his hand. He was in a state of health which made him despondent about many things, though least of all about what was most in danger. The long concealment of his marriage from his father made the disclosure of it far, far more difficult than it would have been at first. Unsupported by Roger, how could he explain it all to one so passionate as the squire? How tell of the temptation, the stolen marriage, the consequent happiness, and, alas, the consequent suffering? For Osborne had suffered, and did suffer greatly in the untoward circumstances in which he had placed himself. He saw no way out of it excepting by the one strong stroke of which he felt himself incapable. So with a heavy heart he addressed himself to his book again. Everything seemed to come in his way, and he was not strong enough in character to overcome obstacles. The only overt step he took in consequence of what he had heard from his father was to ride over to Hollingford the first fine day after he had received the news, and go to see Cynthia and the Gibsons. He had not been there for a long time bad weather and languor combined had prevented him. He found them full of preparations and discussions about Cynthia's visit to London, and she herself not at all in the sentimental mood proper to respond to his delicate intimations of how glad he was in his brother's joy. Indeed it was so long after the time that Cynthia scarcely perceived that to him the intelligence was recent, 
and that the first bloom of his emotions had not yet passed away. With her head a little on one side, she was contemplating the effect of a knot of ribbons, when he began in a low whisper, and leaning forward towards her as he spoke. "'Cynthia! I may call you Cynthia now, mayn't I? I'm so glad of this news. I've only just heard of it, but I'm so glad.' "'What news do you mean?' She had her suspicions, but she was annoyed to think that from one person her secret was passing to another and another, till in fact it was becoming no secret at all. Still Cynthia could always conceal her annoyance when she chose. "'Why are you to begin calling me Cynthia now?' she went on smiling. "'The terrible word has slipped out from between your lips before. Do you know?' This light way of taking his tender congratulation did not quite please Osborne, who was in a sentimental mood, and for a minute or so he remained silent. Then, having finished making her bow of ribbon, she turned to him, and continued in a quick low voice, anxious to take advantage of a conversation between her mother and Molly. I think I can guess why you made that pretty little speech just now. But do you know, you ought not to have been told. And, moreover, things are not quite arrived at the solemnity of—of—well, an engagement. He would not have it so. Now I shan't say anything more, and you must not. Pray remember you ought not to have known. It is my own secret, and I particularly wished it not to be spoken about, and I don't like its being so talked about. Oh, the leaking of water through one small hole!" And then she plunged into the talk of the other two, making the conversation general. Osborne was rather discomfited at the non-success of his congratulations. He had pictured to himself the unbosoming of a lovesick girl, full of rapture, and glad of a sympathizing confidant. He little knew Cynthia's nature. The more she suspected that she was called upon for a display of emotion, the less would she show and her emotions were generally under the control of her will. He had made an effort to come and see her, and now he leant back in his chair, weary and a little dispirited. "'You poor dear young man,' said Mrs. Gibson, coming up to him with her soft, soothing manner. "'How tired you look! Do take some of that eau de cologne and bathe your forehead. This spring weather overcomes me too. Primavera, I think the Italians call it but it is very trying for delicate constitutions, as much from its associations as from its variableness of temperature. It makes me sigh perpetually, but then I am so sensitive. Dear Lady Cumnor always used to say I was like a thermometer. You've heard how ill she has been?" No, said Osborne, not very much caring either. Oh, yes, she is better now, but the anxiety about her has tried me so, detained here by what are, of course, my duties, but far away from all intelligence, and not knowing what the next post might bring." "'Where was she, then?' said Osborne, becoming a little more sympathetic. "'At Spa, such a distance off, three days' post. Can't you conceive the trial, living with her as I did for years, bound up in the family as I was?' But Lady Harriet said in her last letter that they hoped she would be stronger than she had been for years," said Molly innocently. "'Yes, Lady Harriet, of course. Every one who knows Lady Harriet knows that she is of too sanguine a temperament for her statements to be perfectly relied on. Altogether, strangers are often deluded by Lady Harriet. She has an off-hand manner which takes them in, but she does not mean half she says." "'We will hope she does in this instance said Cynthia shortly. They're in London now, and Lady Cumnor hasn't suffered from the journey." "'They say so,' said Mrs. Gibson, shaking her head, and laying an emphasis on the word say. "'I am perhaps over-anxious, but I wish—I wish I could see and judge for myself. It would be the only way of calming my anxiety. I almost think I shall go up with you, Cynthia, for a day or two, just to see her with my own eyes. I don't quite like your travelling alone, either. We will think about it, and you shall write to Mr. Kirkpatrick and propose it, if we determine upon it. You can tell him of my anxiety, and it will be only sharing your bed for a couple of nights." End of chapter 39「Wives and Daughters, this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell. Chapter 40 Molly Gibson Breathes Freely. 
That was the way in which Mrs. Gibson first broached her intention of accompanying Cynthia up to London for a few days' visit. She had a trick of producing the first sketch of any new plan before an outsider to the family circle, so that the first emotions of others, if they disapproved of her projects, had to be repressed until the idea had become familiar to them. To Molly it seemed too charming a proposal ever to come to pass. She had never allowed herself to recognize the restraint she was under in her stepmother's presence, but all at once she found it out when her heart danced at the idea of three whole days, for that it would be at the least, of perfect freedom of intercourse with her father, of old times come back again, of meals without perpetual fidgetiness after details of ceremony and correctness of attendance. "'We'll have bread and cheese for dinner, and eat it on our knees. We'll make up for having had to eat sloppy puddings with a fork instead of a spoon all this time, by putting our knives in our mouths till we cut ourselves. Papa shall pour his tea into his saucer, if he's in a hurry. And if I'm thirsty, I'll take the slop basin. And, oh, if I could but get, buy, borrow, or steal any kind of an old horse! And my grey skirt isn't new, but it will do. That would be too delightful. After all, I think I can be happy again. For months and months it has seemed as if I had got too old ever to feel pleasure, much less happiness again." So thought Molly. Yet she blushed as if with guilt when Cynthia, reading her thoughts, said to her one day, "'Molly, you're very glad to get rid of us, are you not?' "'Not of you, Cynthia. At least I don't think I am. Only, if you but knew how I love papa, and how I used to see a great deal more of him than ever I do now." "'Ah! I often think what interlopers we must seem, and are, in fact. I don't feel you as such. You, at any rate, have been a new delight to me, a sister, and I never knew how charming such a relationship could be." "'But mamma," said Cynthia, half suspiciously, half sorrowfully. She is papa's wife," said Molly quietly. I don't mean to say I'm not often very sorry to feel I'm no longer first with him. But it was. The violent colour flushed into her face till even her eyes burnt, and she suddenly found herself on the point of crying. The weeping ash-tree, the misery, the slow dropping comfort, and the comforter came all so vividly before her. It was Roger. She went on looking up at Cynthia as she overcame her slight hesitation at mentioning his name. "'Roger, who told me how I ought to take papa's marriage, when I was first startled and grieved at the news. Oh, Cynthia, what a great thing it is to be loved by him!' Cynthia blushed and looked fluttered and pleased. "'Yes, I suppose it is. At the same time, Molly, I'm afraid he'll expect me to be always as good as he fancies me now, and I shall have to walk on tiptoe all the rest of my life." "'But you are good, Cynthia,' put in Molly. "'No, I'm not. You're just as much mistaken as he is. And some day I shall go down in your opinions with a run, just like the hall clock the other day when the spring broke." "'I think he'll love you just as much,' said Molly. "'Could you? Would you be my friend if—if if it turned out ever that I had done very wrong things? Would you remember how very difficult it has sometimes been to me to act rightly?' She took hold of Molly's hand as she spoke. "'We won't speak of Mamma, for your sake as much as mine or hers. But you must see she isn't one to help a girl with much good advice or good—oh, Molly, you don't know how I was neglected just at a time when I wanted friends most. Mamma does not know it. It is not in her to know what I might have been if I had only fallen into wise good hands. But I know it. And what's more," continued she, suddenly ashamed of her unusual exhibition of feeling, I try not to care, which I dare say is really the worst of all. But I could worry myself to death if I once took to serious thinking. I wish I could help you or even understand you," said Molly, after a moment or two of sad perplexity. "'You can help me,' said Cynthia, changing her manner abruptly. "'I can trim bonnets and make head-dresses, but somehow my hands can't fold up gowns and collars like your deft little fingers. Please, will you help me to pack? 
that's a real tangible piece of kindness, and not sentimental consolation for sentimental distresses, which are perhaps imaginary after all. In general, it is the people that are left behind stationary, who give way to low spirits at any parting. The travellers, however bitterly they may feel the separation, find something in the change of scene to soften regret in the very first hour of separation. But as Molly walked home with her father from seeing Mrs. Gibson and Cynthia off to London by the umpire coach, she almost danced in the street. "'Now, papa,' said she, "'I am going to have you all to myself for a whole week. You must be very obedient.' "'Don't be tyrannical, then. You're walking me out of breath, and we're cutting Mrs. Goodenough in our hurry.' So they crossed over the street to speak to Mrs. Goodenough. "'We've just been seeing my wife and her daughter off to London. Mrs. Gibson has gone up for a week.' "'Deary, deary, to London, and only for a week! Why, I can remember it's being a three days' journey. It'll be very lonesome for you, Miss Molly, without your young companion.' "'Yes,' said Molly, suddenly feeling as if she ought to have taken this view of the case. "'I shall miss Cynthia very much.' "'And you, Mr. Gibson! Why, it'll be like being a widower over again! You must come and drink tea with me some evening. We must try and cheer you up a bit amongst us. Shall it be Tuesday?" In spite of the sharp pinch which Molly gave to his arm, Mr. Gibson accepted the invitation, much to the gratification of the old lady. "'Papa, how could you go and waste one of our evenings? We have but six in all, and now but five, and I had so reckoned on our doing all sorts of things together." "'What sort of things?' "'Oh, I don't know. Everything that is unrefined and ungenteel," added she, slyly looking up into her father's face. His eyes twinkled, but the rest of his face was perfectly grave. "'I am not going to be corrupted. With toil and labour I've reached a very fair height of refinement. I won't be pulled down again.' "'Yes, you will, papa. We'll have bread and cheese for lunch this very day, and you shall wear your slippers in the drawing-room every evening you'll stay quietly at home. And, oh, papa, don't you think I could ride Nora Craina? I've been looking out the old grey skirt, and I think I could make myself tidy." "'Where is the side-saddle to come from?' "'To be sure, the old one won't fit that great Irish mare. But I'm not particular, papa. I think I could manage somehow." "'Thank you, but I'm not going to quite return into barbarism. It may be a depraved taste, but I should like to see my daughter properly mounted." Think of riding together down the lanes. Why, the dog-roses must be all out in flower, and the honeysuckles and the hay. How I should like to see Merriman's farm again! Papa, do let me have one ride with you. Please do. I'm sure we can manage it somehow." And somehow it was managed. Somehow all Molly's wishes came to pass. There was only one little drawback to this week of holiday and happy intercourse with her father. Everybody would ask them out to tea. They were quite like bride and bridegroom, for the fact was that the late dinners which Mrs. Gibson had introduced into her own house were a great inconvenience in the calculations of all the small tea-drinkings at Hollingford. How ask people to tea at six who dined at that hour? How, when they refused cake and sandwiches at half-past eight, how induce other people who were really hungry to commit a vulgarity before those calm and scornful eyes? So there had been a great lull of invitations for the Gibsons to Hollingford tea-parties. Mrs. Gibson, whose object was to squeeze herself into county society, had taken this being left out of the smaller festivities with great equanimity, but Molly missed the kind homeliness of the parties to which she had gone from time to time as long as she could remember, and though as each three-cornered note was brought in she grumbled a little over the loss of another charming evening with her father, she really was glad to go again in the old way among old friends. Miss Browning and Miss Phoebe were especially compassionate towards her in her loneliness. If they had had their will, she would have dined there every day, and she had to call upon them very frequently in order to prevent their being hurt at her declining the dinners. Mrs. Gibson wrote twice during her week's absence to her husband. That piece of news was quite satisfactory to the Miss Brownings, who had of late held themselves a great deal aloof from a house where they chose to suppose that their presence was not wanted. In their winter evenings they had often talked over Mr. Gibson's household, and having little besides conjecture to go upon, they found the subject interminable, as they could vary the possibilities every day. One of their wonders was how Mr. and Mrs. Gibson really got on together. 
Another was whether Mrs. Gibson was extravagant or not. Now two letters during the week of her absence showed what was in those days considered a very proper amount of conjugal affection. Yet not too much, at elevenpence halfpenny postage. A third letter would have been extravagant. Sister looked to sister with an approving nod as Molly named the second letter, which arrived in Hollingford the very day before Mrs. Gibson was to return. They had settled between themselves that two letters would show the right amount of good feeling and proper understanding in the Gibson family. More would have been extravagant, only one would have been a matter of mere duty. There had been rather a question between Miss Browning and Miss Phoebe as to which person the second letter, supposing it came, was to be addressed to. It would be very conjugal to write twice to Mr. Gibson, and yet it would be very pretty if Molly came in for her share. "'You've had another letter, you say, my dear?' asked Miss Browning. "'I dare say Mrs. Gibson has written to you this time.' "'It is a large sheet, and Cynthia has written on one half to me, and all the rest is to papa.' "'A very nice arrangement, I'm sure. And what does Cynthia say? Is she enjoying herself?' "'Oh, yes, I think so. They've had a dinner-party, and one night when Mamma was at Lady Cumnor's, Cynthia went to the play with her cousins.' "'Upon my word! And all in one week! I do call that dissipation! My Thursday would be taken up with the journey, and Friday with resting, and Sunday is Sunday all the world over, and they must have written on Tuesday. Well, I hope Cynthia won't find Hollingford dull, that's all, when she comes back.' "'I don't think it's likely.' said Miss Phoebe, with a little simper and a knowing look, which sat oddly on her kindly innocent face. "'You see a great deal of Mr. Preston, don't you, Molly?' "'Mr. Preston?' said Molly, flushing up with surprise. "'No, not much. He's been at Ashcombe all winter, you know. He has but just come back to settle here. What should make you think so?' "'Oh, a little bird told us,' said Miss Browning. Molly knew that little bird from her childhood, and it always hated it and longed to wring its neck. Why could not people speak out and say that they did not mean to give up the name of their informant? But it was a very favourite form of fiction with the Miss Brownings, and to Miss Phoebe it was the very acme of wit. "'The little bird was flying about one day in Heath Lane, and it saw Mr. Preston and a young lady, we won't say who, walking together in a very friendly manner. That is to say, he was on horseback. But the path is raised above the road, just where there is a little wooden bridge over the brook. "'Perhaps Molly is in on the secret, and we ought not to ask her about it,' said Miss Phoebe, seeing Molly's extreme discomfiture and annoyance. "'It can be no great secret,' said Miss Browning, dropping the little bird formula and assuming an air of dignified reproval at Miss Phoebe's interruption. "'For Miss Hornblower says Mr. Preston owns to being engaged.' "'At any rate it isn't to Cynthia, that I know positively,' said Molly, with some vehemence. "'And pray put a stop to such reports. You don't know what mischief they may do. I do so hate that kind of chatter.' It was not very respectful of Molly to speak in this way to be sure, but she thought only of Roger, and the distress any such reports might cause, should he hear of them, in the centre of Africa, made her colour up scarlet with vexation. Heighty tighty "'Miss Molly! Don't you remember that I am old enough to be your mother, and that it is not pretty behaviour to speak so to us, to me? Chatter, to be sure! Really, Molly!' "'I beg your pardon,' said Molly, only half penitent. "'I dare say you did not mean to speak so to sister,' said Miss Phoebe, trying to make peace. Molly did not answer all at once. She wanted to explain how much mischief might be done by such reports. "'But don't you see?' she went on, still flushed by vexation. How bad it is to talk of such things in such a way! Supposing one of them cared for some one else, and that might happen, you know. Mr. Preston, for instance, may be engaged to some one else. Molly! I pity the woman! Indeed I do! I have a very poor opinion of Mr. Preston," said Miss Browning, in a warning tone of voice, for a new idea had come into her head. "'Well, but the woman or young lady would not like to hear such reports about Mr. Preston. "'Perhaps not. But for all that, take my word for it, he's a great flirt, and young ladies had better not have much to do with him.' "'I dare say it was all an accident, their meeting in Heath Lane,' said Miss Phoebe. "'I know nothing about it,' said Molly. "'And I dare say I have been impertinent. Only please don't talk about it any more. I have my reasons for asking you.' 
She got up, for by the striking of the church clock she had just found out it was later than she had thought, and she knew that her father would be at home by this time. She bent down and kissed Miss Browning's grave and passive face. "'How you are growing, Molly!' said Miss Phoebe, anxious to cover over her sister's displeasure. "'As tall and as straight as a poplar tree, as the old song says.' "'Grow in grace, Molly, as well as in good looks,' said Miss Browning watching her out of the room. As soon as she was fairly gone, Miss Browning got up and shut the door securely, then sitting down near her sister she said in a low voice, "'Phoebe, it was Molly herself that was with Mr. Preston in Heath Lane that day, when Mrs. Goodenough saw them together.' "'Gracious goodness me!' exclaimed Miss Phoebe, receiving it at once as gospel. "'How do you know?' "'By putting two and two together. Didn't you notice how red Molly went, and then pale, and how she said she knew for a fact that Mr. Preston and Cynthia Kirkpatrick were not engaged. Perhaps not engaged, but Mrs. Goodenough saw them loitering together all by their own two selves. Mrs. Goodenough only crossed Heath Lane at the Shire Oak as she was riding in her phaeton," said Miss Browning sententiously. We all know what a coward she is in a carriage, so that she most likely had only half her wits about her, and her eyes are none of the best when she is standing steady on the road. Molly and Cynthia have got their new plaid shawls just alike, and they trim their bonnets alike, and Molly has grown as tall as Cynthia since Christmas. I was always afraid she'd be short and stumpy, but now she's as tall and slender as anybody need be. I'll answer for it. Mrs. Goodenough saw Molly, and took her for Cynthia." When Miss Browning answered for it, Miss Phoebe gave up doubting. She sat some time in silence revolving her thoughts. Then she said, wouldn't be such a very bad match after all, sister." She spoke very meekly, awaiting her sister's sanction to her opinion. "'Phoebe! It would be a bad match for Mary Pearson's daughter. If I had known what I know now, we'd never have had him to tea last September." "'Why, what do you know?' asked Miss Phoebe. "'Miss Hornblower told me many things, some that I don't think you ought to hear, Phoebe. He was engaged to a very pretty Miss Gregson at Hennock when he comes from, and her father made inquiries, and heard so much that was bad about him, that he made his daughter break off the match, and she's dead since." "'How shocking!' said Miss Phoebe, duly impressed. "'Besides, he plays at billiards, and he bets at races, and some people say he keeps race-horses." "'But isn't it strange that the Earl keeps him on as his agent?' No, perhaps not. He's very clever about land, and very sharp in all law affairs, and my lord isn't bound to take notice, if indeed he knows, of the manner in which Mr. Preston talks when he has had too much wine." "'Taken too much wine! Oh, sister, is he a drunkard? And we have had him to tea!' "'I didn't say he was a drunkard, Phoebe,' said Miss Browning pettishly. "'A man may take too much wine occasionally without being a drunkard. Don't let me hear you using such coarse words, Phoebe." Miss Phoebe was silent for a time after this rebuke. Presently she said, "'I do hope it wasn't Molly Gibson. You may hope as much as you like, but I'm pretty sure it was. However, we'd better say nothing about it to Mrs. Goodenough. She has got Cynthia into her head, and there let her rest. Time enough to set reports afloat about Molly when we know there's some truth in them. Mr. Preston might do for Cynthia, who's been brought up in France, though she has such pretty manners, but it may not have made her particular. He must not, and he shall not have Molly, if I go into the church and forbid the bands myself. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid there's something between her and him. We must keep on the lookout, Phoebe. I'll be her guardian angel in spite of herself." End of chapter 40